Welcome to week eight of Film 256 Underground Films. Today we are going to discuss the uh, issue of censorship uh, in relation with underground cinema. Censorship is an important uh, topic and that maybe causes the rise of underground uh, film movements in certain countries. Now, it, it doesn't always cause underground movements. Sometimes films are just partially censored or just banned for years. It depends what sort of uh, censorship policies are, are taken in a specific time and place. And you can see that um, censorship is done in many different forms in different countries and in different uh, time periods. This is not going to be a, a historical survey of uh, going through all forms of censorship in, in history of cinema. I'm going to be brief on that, but and why censorship is important, why we have censorships in all countries. Why still in most countries, still we have some form of uh, censorship or any classifications or some sort of a state control at hand. Censorship uh, is an attempt in limiting the freedom of expressions, production and distribution or exhibition in various forms. If uh, cinema usually considered as something modern, it's something that just uh, a little bit over 100 years old, it's usually linked to modernity. And from the very beginning, there is an old practice of witch hunting uh, going on against uh, film producers and filmmakers. The images are always considered very threatening. From the very early on uh, in history of cinema, from the very early on, early uh, 20th century, we have pornography scenes of violence and censorships. For example, in early cinema, boxing films were uh, at some point banned. Or one of the early films were uh, an electrification of an elephant by Edison was considered as very uh, shocking. And then again, there were various forms of uh, control against display of sexual activities on uh, screen from the very beginning. So one uh, thing that we should con uh, consider is the term hegemony. Uh, hegemony is the term, if you never heard of it, is a term um, coined by Italian uh, Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci. And he would see the act of censorship as something discrete in the society. So it's not always... Um, uh, the state law is not always enforced by uh, presence of military or police force in, in the tradition of extremely regulative dictatorships. So there is a discrete form of self-regulation in order to maintain the value system of the society. Certain ideas, certain acts should be naturalized and other Forbidden things should be seen as deviant behavior and, in a way, non-existence. For instance, in terms of the sexuality, always uh, heterosexuality is something that has been naturalized. And any other forms, including uh, homosexuality, as something deviant. And it's just always, uh, they, they try to show it as something non-existence. And when... It, it, it for some reason appears it should be uh, punished and there is a, some sort of a public approval for uh, strong censorship to, to use censorship. Sometimes the society's reaction is quick and has a form of moral panic like in the 90s with the rise of LGBT movements and queer films and queer festivals. Uh, the media started a um, strong reaction uh, against LGBT characters uh, in the movies, like in comedies, in TV series, they started to make fun of homosexual couples. So the censorship is not always taking place uh, through, uh, the, through certain regulating 
policies. Censorship is always broader than what the, the government bodies is trying to do. And that's when the, the, the hegemony comes. Of course, government intervention is an important part, the policies, the regulations. So uh, another philosopher, Michel Foucault, uh, talks about the logic of censorship as something, a fundamental element in our communication. So for, for Foucault, and he wrote this book, Histoire de la Sexualité, he talks about the, the, uh, how the, the logic of censorship is always in any of forms of communication in our society regarding sexuality and it's from the very moment that the kids are trying to talk about their private uh, life and there, there's an intervention by the parents this um, censorship is going to be internalized in the child and it's an integral part of uh, communication communication is always dependent on certain discourses another term that Foucault uses a lot discourse Maybe I can say in a simple way that is as a system of thought. And no discourses can function without its own rules and norms. So uh, censorship is something fundamental in our society that we cannot see, especially in, like, in the practice of gender, in display of sexuality, even in something that is supposed to be um, underground, like porn pornography is for being in our underground, is still the hegemonic ideas about sexual norms, um, that the, the place of women, for example, is enforced and, and is present uh, in, in, in these uh, films. So it's censorship is a great mechanism for cultural selection uh, and cultural civilization. As I said, we have very different forms of censorships in different countries but there are probably you can see similar logic as Foucault suggested in all countries that the reason behind uh, censorships there is a scholar uh, by the name of Sue Carey Johnson who wrote um, histories and theories of censorship and again uh, she talks about why there is this great control always over all modes of film production. So uh, censorship in cinema usually happens for three reasons. Explicit portrayal of sexuality, either in terms of its graphic or its theme, the forms of sexuality that is forbidden in our society. And then politics, of course, in many countries, politics... Uh, it's important uh, reason for censorship and that gives the rise of underground film movements. Um, these things are not always against each other. I will talk about how, for instance, certain movements in uh, producing underground pornographies in Japan, Italy, and Spain, they used highly um, erotic pornographic films to also point at uh, certain political uh, situations in, in the country. So they, there were, there were um, these um, actually uh, hardcore uh, sometimes uh, display of pornographic um, acts in these films were always shown as some sort of a resistance. And, and another thing is that who is doing the censorship? Well, I said that there is the, when it's about the, the, the idea of hegemony or Foucault's logic of censorship, Sometimes it's self-regulatory. It's something discrete in the society. But as policies and regulations, it's either the government, and uh, there's an, a direct intervention, or sometimes with a like case code in Hollywood, um, the government is asking the film industry to impose censorship. Otherwise, we're going to interfere. So you should do something so we know that you are concerned about the, the social norms and what is considered as morally obscene in the society so that the industry sometimes itself and sometimes for economical reason uh, self-regulates sometimes there's a direct government uh, intervention it could be from the very stage to get the finance to um, get the approval sometimes it's just during the exhibitions i talked about in in the second week on American cinema, how huh, in certain exhibition of John Smith film, there was police intervention 
arrest and uh, the confiscations of the movie's reels. But another form is not always coming from the government, uh, sometimes with the Catholic Church when they are powerful. Uh, that happened in Italy, also in, in Hollywood at certain points, but also in Mexico, Ireland, um, Spain. Uh, in Canada, uh, specifically Catholic Church passed strong um, censorship laws in um, the province of Quebec, and, and because uh, the Catholic Church was powerful before uh, the, the Quiet Revolution in the 60s in, in Quebec, and that's why we have like a strong, strong censorship laws. And also things like kids under certain age couldn't even go to movie theaters in Quebec for decades. The history of production code in the United States is usually tied to what is known as Hays Code. Although from the very beginning, like two years after the inventions of cinematograph in 1895, we had um, laws in different states for uh, censorships and exhibitions of certain materials. The official production code was introduced in the 1930s and it was because there was a, a sort of moral panic in the society. Um, because the turn of the 20th century was a time of social progressiveness, uh, introduction or a rapid experience of modernity and certain uh, cultural uh, changes. So movies were being seen by the guardians of the old order, such as the Catholic Church, as a, a threat, uh, as something that is going to change uh, the old norms uh, forever. So that's why they were uh, seeing uh, the, the content of these movies as questionable. So for that, rapid changes in the society and popularity of the movies in the early 20th century, there was a moral panic and there was a, a fear and that causes this um, disproportionate uh, reaction in film industries. So from the 1930s, those uh, moral guardians um, were uh, fearing that the movies would have bad influence on the nation's youth, for example. They uh, introduced uh, production code. So um, as it was introduced in the 1930s, it, in the first five years until, um, the, until 1935, it was not uh, being enforced severely. And that's why this period in the early sound films and those early years after the introduction of production code usually is known as pre-codes. And before 1934, you can see actually movies in Hollywood, certain scenes that you uh, probably wouldn't believe to come out of black and white movies. These things were eradicated after 1935 and the, the, a couple of um, decades after the World War II. So the production code introduced as certain um, codes of decency in movies in terms of representations of um, sexuality, marriage and love, for example, the uh, do's and don'ts, and also in terms of the, the, the crime. And you know that in the, the 1930s, crime film and gangster films are becoming very popular specifically with the coming of sound films are being more realistic and there was so there was other things like legions of decency and uh, pca production code administrative 
So in the beginnings, things like adultery, seduction, rape shouldn't be shown in details on um, screens, some as like addiction. Um, and uh, there was an idea that, for instance, uh, crimes, like there, there shouldn't be details of the weapon. Law enforcement should not be killed by the criminals in, in the movie and, and, and so on. This uh, led to the, to the government intervention or because of the fear of government interventions, Hollywood um, started to accept enforcement of William H. Hayes uh, codes. Uh, there were interesting things when I say that so naturally like sexual violence shouldn't be shown on a screen, but what is not considered as approved? So imagine love should end in marriage and crime and punishment. But what is love? For example, some of these codes were not written, but they were discreetly being practiced. Interracial love, a love between a black and white uh, character shouldn't be finished in happy ending. So that would be not be that relation interracial relationship would not be considered as love. It should be punished. Uh, again, a, a good a good female character should not smoke on the screen. All uh, these things, and you can see in these pictures, even husband and wife. Uh, in the room should sleep in separate beds. If they are in the same bed, one leg of each character should be um, outside on the floor. These are all an integral mechanism of the production code was to specify and decide how women and people of color uh, should be portrayed on the screen. After the post-war and in the 40s and 50s, other uh, issues were uh, being applied. Um, so I'm sure we have in the 50s, there was a McCarty's witch hunt uh, against certain screenplay regarding uh, their sort of affinities with leftist groups. Uh, in the 50s, one person behind the enforcement of uh, production code had uh, strange anti-semi sentiments. And at that time, during the uh, post-war years, in the next two decades, although many German Jewish filmmakers were working in Hollywood at that time, the topic of Holocaust was rarely dealt with in Hollywood movies. Um, so this um, production code officially was removed in 1968, but was not really being practiced after the 1960s with the release of the movie Spartacus. Uh, and that one, again, it was because the, the industry was threatened because of the TV first, and unapproved foreign films were being shown in the movie theaters, smaller movie theaters in New York City. Younger audiences were more interested in uh, those films like Antonio and his Godard, and they were showing more nudities. So the Hollywood industry was in danger to, to survive, so they had to remove the codes. These codes later on uh, turned into rating systems, parental guides, and that also changed. And sometimes release of one movie Actually, the Hayes Code, some people say that was a reaction to one of the movies by uh, Fatty Arbuckle. A rating system, the rating system that we have now, one um, movie that caused this new uh, rating system was Almodovar's Time Me Up, Time Me Down. And um, there was a controversy. A new uh, rating system was introduced that we still have that sort of rating system for uh, Hollywood movies. So the point that I was I wanted to make about what is considered so certain things uh, are being introduced, but it's interesting what elements are attached. So it's like rape, seduction, and sexual violence should not be shown on a screen. Interracial love is one of those. For example, uh, a, a woman who smokes is considered indecent. Uh, so these things are attached to different um, censorship laws in different countries. Um, and there are other things in different countries. In, in, in Korea, still uh, Japanese troops during the World War II uh, cannot be shown in positive ways, for example. In Japan, there was the same uh, thing about American troops. They shouldn't be shown in negative uh, terms for, for uh, a while after the Second World War. Uh, before getting into more uh, political examples of uh, censorship in countries like China and Iran, I uh, just want to give you an example uh, with regards to uh, the 
use of pornography as, as a form of, again, political resistance in Japanese cinema. For example, the, the trailer that you're going to see in the background, uh, this uh, movie in the realm of the census by Nagasi Oshima uh, was a very um, shocking film for his time. He just went against this, the censorship. But that actually Marsh, military Marsh in the beginning uh, that you saw was interesting. This film looks like just non-stop images of sometimes even hardcore pornography. But what is behind it is actually a, a criticism of uh, the rise of fascism or some sort of a commentary on the rise of fascism in, in Japan uh, before the World War II. So there's one scene that this guy, after being uh, in, in this room for days having sex, is walking um, uh, in a sort of crippled way, is so tired of um, the and, and other people are sort of commenting that he smells and so on. And then he walks against the, the, the military, young, healthy military and masculine um, people in the opposite direction. And that scene is, in, um, some, is, is considered as some sort of a, a commentary about the rise of militarism before uh, the Second World War in Japan. So in the realm of the census is an example of a Japanese film who um, bypassed uh, the strong censorship laws in Japan, made the movie, but uh, called it a French production, not a Japanese production, by sending uh, the reels to France and editing the, the, the final uh, version of the movies there. Um, another movie that, again, um, had to win uh, certain legal battles in the United States that I just talked about is a Spanish film by Pedro Amador called Tie Me Up, uh, Tie Me Down. Um, so in terms of the, the political censorship, although like in the realm of the census, for example, um, many of those um, erotic films, they like for instance, Japanese and Spanish films, they, they had a, a strong political undertone. Um, but I want to also talk about the state control and, and the rise of underground films in certain countries with strong uh, censorship laws and how those uh, alternative films are produced and received. Um, this is definitely is happening in many countries, but I decided to focus on two countries, uh, China and Iran. In terms of the, the alternative uh, film culture in China, in the last uh, three decades from the 90s, uh, we see the rise of critically acclaimed Chinese low-budget films that uh, were denied the standard distributions in the country. They were also, they were kind of unofficial. A number of these films are said to be made in uh, the, the basement um, with a very uh, small crew. But one fact that we know, a number of them uh, were considered uh, unofficial. They were illegal to be made. They didn't get um, the, the necessarily documents and approval of the scripts. So historically, the Communist Party introduced a strong censorship law uh, in 1949 and for 40 years they banned private sectors. So they aggressively strengthened um, the, the production codes and the state control. Uh, it was in the early 1990s that younger filmmakers began to, to make low budget films. And that's also, uh, we should say that thanks to the technology, um, such acts uh, were becoming possible, and I will talk about the, the about this sort of um, technological uh, facilities. Uh, the, the fact that it's cheaper to make movies, especially with the transition to digital filmmaking, that for that reason, the the young filmmakers uh, they can bypass the law and create their own movies. 
So why these filmmakers were not uh, following the law and were resisting the, the state control in China? So of course, uh, the filmmakers wanted greater uh, freedom of expression, including freedom from oppressive and restrictive uh, political and bureaucratic controls. So in many aspects, these films were underground. Um, most producers of these works do not submit their script or even a rough cuts to the state for those sort of uh, bureaucratic um, requirements of the law. So in that sense, uh, these Chinese independent films are underground because they suggest political resistance, a, a form of secret production that stands in subversive opposition uh, to the state um, dominations of the film industry in China. But more importantly, it resists the state's and the party's dominations of political life in China. For example, uh, there was a movie called Blind Shaft by um, an underground director, Li Yang, uh, in 2002. This film frankly dealt with um, rough situations of coal mining industry in Northwest China. So um, what the state uh, is doing, they're not really banning these filmmakers to, to make these films. The state controls the distributions and ex exhibitions uh, network in China. In that sense, the, these filmmakers have problem to exhibit their movies in conventional ways inside the countries, although they were successful in Western festivals. One of one important characteristics of underground Chinese films is uh, the notion of personality and personal identity as a form of resistance to the, the main ideologies of the socialist states. For example, we mainly we see in, in, both in documentary films and, and feature films individuals trying to give meaning to their uh, fractured, fractured lives and they, they try to find a specific sort of uh, identity. Number of time, even like sexual identity, for example, is, is important uh, theme, um, like the, the theme of homosexuality, for example, in these films. So even um, many of these uh, filmmakers are interested in documentaries. Uh, I can still say that objectivity was really a concern for these independent uh, directors. They always um, desire to reclaim the artist's subjectivity. Another political um, sensitive subject in China that they, these films deal with are the, the lives of marginal subjects, outcasts, people who, are, who remain otherwise voiceless or powerless in, in China. So in a way, these Chinese independent productions are... Um, receiving international acclaims in Western film festivals because they reveal the otherwise hidden truths and realities of Chinese society. Uh, this movie, for example, is called The Beijing's Bastards, and it's depicting a variety of marginalized youth as bastard. And apparently in China, Bastard is a word that is much avoided in communication. It has a negative connotation and depicting young people um, in um, just rock band rehearsal with no home, unemployed, um, just, just acting on their instinct uh, is something that is not promoted by the state media. So consider that in a communist country, usually um, they, uh, the, the sort of ideologies that they have promotes a, a sort of a goal-oriented society. And each person should act in a way that is contributing to, to a larger goal. But these young, um, desperate, confused uh, people who are just rehearsing in rock bands and they talk about drugs, abortion, again, all other uh, things that are not presented in um, mainstream media in China. Uh, so for all these things, it, it can see uh, an, an, a depiction of an underground life, and it's an underground film. It was 
and um, an official film in Lucarno Film Festivals and won the award. And the Chinese government removed their own selection, their official selection, in uh, protest against um, the presence of this movie uh, in that festival. So it's again, it's about the idea of the subject. When I said that the personality is very important, it's semi documentary, it's a drama documentary. Um, but again, what I say that the idea of the subject is very important, but the subject who is uh, unstable and fragmentary. This is one of the first films, first independent uh, films made in China. And usually uh, they say that actually uh, the new generation of uh, the, the six generations of filmmakers um, began uh, by the release of uh, this film. And so the, the 1990s, specifically with this film, we see the return of amateur filmmaking uh, against the state censorship in uh, China and a, a movement that is usually called uh, the sixth generation of uh, Chinese filmmaking. Another Chinese film that I want to talk about is called Unknown Pleasure. Again, it's a kind of movie that uh, follows the characters who have aimless lifestyle. It has little eroticism and black humor, but what you see is that these characters are just looking for a pleasure, but maybe the pleasure that is unachieved and they can never really understand what would give them pleasure. So in a way, it's um, showing the emptiness of the lives of um, these posed young uh, people in China. So again, uh, a sense of confusion uh, is at the center of this film. The next underground national cinema that I want to discuss is contemporary Iranian cinema. In Iranian uh, film industry, uh, there's a, a strong uh, censorship uh, law and government intervention, specifically after the 1979 uh, revolution. Uh, that doesn't mean that the entire industry is, is controlled by a state. Filmmakers do not have to be uh, necessarily affiliated, but uh, there's always uh, a, start, a state controls in different level from pre-production to the production and post-production. Sometimes, sometimes films get the approval from the Ministry of Culture exactly the day that they are supposed to be released in movie theaters, um, they, they get banned. And that actually has a very negative um, effect on the filmmakers because they were expecting to earn uh, the monies and that they spent i mean like the producers but in, in many different layers these things happen and there are different uh, competing law enforcement for example there was um uh, in the 90s there was a movie by, made by iranian female filmmaker and uh, that movie got the permission to be shown in movie theaters, but while the movie was being shown in the movie theaters, uh, the filmmaker was arrested and spent times in jail because of that movies. And uh, state's television refused uh, to show the trailers for that film. So it has a very complicated uh, regulation, uh, but it's very aggressive, I would say. From the 1980s, uh, there was a new movement in Iranian cinema called Poetic Realism. This movement was um, highly uh, inspired by Italian new realism. And uh, so like Italian new realism, non-actors, kids in main roles, uh, and what uh, Iranian cinema added was often cars uh, inside the cars as the best location. And later on, um, the digital cinematography helped these filmmakers because they always had problems with the state for uh, the topics that they were uh, tackling with. Uh, for example, Cure Stems 10 that you see the poster here was a movie that uh, that is entirely shot inside a car 
without the presence of the crew and the filmmakers because with the digital cinematography that's that becoming possible they just place uh, the camera inside um, the the car and that adds to more uh, realism so the characters are free uh, to interact and they do not see the presence uh, of um, the filmmakers and it's not going to to affect the realistic uh, dialogues um, that were expected from them so that was one movie uh, that was made with the uh, digital technology and in a way it just tackled the issue of oppression of women and dress codes in the islamic republic before talking about jafar panahi the director that we are focusing today i'm going to talk about another film that is similar to beijing's bastards in in china uh, the first movie is a 2009 film by Bahman Gobadi called Nobody Knows About Persian Cats. This film, this film is about an underground uh, lifestyle in Iran, lifestyle of young people, and namely um, rock bands uh, that were the kind of music that was never uh, promoted in the Islamic Republic. So it's an underground movie uh, that is made about um, underground concerts. And um, in, in this movie, you, you hear um, uh, that the kind of music is um, that its values is opposed to uh, the, the values of the theocratic regime. What you see in this uh, film, again, um, the, the, the young people who do not have, uh, like, who are interested in music, but do not have uh, actually good uh, technology for recording, uh, they, they're just recording their musics in uh, in the basements and they always have to deal with the law enforcement <laughs> so Jafar Panay is the, the figure that we are focusing on um, his movies today. Um, Jafar Panay actually started to work for uh, television and he was making documentaries about the war. But when he started to make his feature films, started to tackle uh, with the topics and issues uh, that were not um, uh, being seen positively by um, uh, the officials. One of the, the movies that he made is called Offside. Offside is a movie that is um, almost entirely uh, taking place uh, along with an actual event, and that was a soccer match between Iran and Bahrain that qualified Iran for the World Cup in Germany in 2006. And this film was made by um, non-actors, and um, the real event was dictating um, uh, the, the entire direction of the movies, even the scripts. So you, the directors and the characters, I mean, the actors wouldn't know uh, if there is going to be a happy ending or sad ending or anything, because uh, they wouldn't, they didn't know if they were going to win the game or not. So they had multiple um, uh, scripts uh, for this movie. Uh, so there was, they didn't have much time for rehearsals. So the entire film almost uh, is taking place in that 90 minutes of uh, the game. It's considered an underground because it's uh, dealing with an issue of women being banned uh, to be uh, in uh, in the stadiums in Iran. And for that reason, although it got the approval and it was made, eventually it was censored and banned. So it was never released, although it got the uh, best uh, film uh, award from Berlin Film Festival. Uh, so because of this movie and a couple of other movies that he made and they tackled sensitive issues, this guy's, guy was banned from filmmaking. Actually, he was actually 
uh, went to the court, arrested, went to the jail, and also part of the verdict was that he couldn't make any movies for five years. Although he was a very international successful filmmaker, uh, he was banned from making movies. And at this point, he made his next film, uh, This Is Not a Film. And he made this film entirely with uh, his cell phones. So uh, the title of the film is This Is Not a Film. Uh, by choosing that, that title, he means that I didn't break the law. Uh, so I should not be arrested for this film. I just made a movie with my cell phone. It was not planned. It didn't have a script. You can see actually the exotic pet. So the entire movie, because he could not get outside the country or make any movies, is taking place inside a room. But that exotic pet that is not domestic to, to Iranian uh, natural life is reminiscent of all the international festivals uh, that he attended that he was a very well-known international figure and uh, probably that was a souvenir from uh, other places in the world. But now he is um, trapped uh, in his home and he has to make uh, a movie uh, with his cell phone um, because again, the, uh, the verdict that he got, uh, that he was banned from making films for five years. Um, so probably for this week we are going to watch either Offside or This Is Not A Film. But I want to talk about another film he made. Um, after being banned from uh, making new movie, and that is called Taxi. And in that film, again, uh, Panahi uh, is stating that he's not breaking the law. He's just uh, working as a, a taxi driver, and uh, there's a camera inside the car. So it's like a, a, a security camera uh, capturing the events inside the taxi. It's not really a planned film. Uh, so, but we know that actually the, the whole the entire humor is that we know that he's an international figure, and uh, so uh, in the clip that you're watching, you're going to see that number of people who get inside his car they would recognize him, and exactly uh, specifically in the clip that I want to show, um, he he's giving a ride uh, to a women's rights activist in Iran who spent a long period of time in jail. نکنین <laughs> از زندان آزاد شدی ولی بیرون زندان بزرگتری میشه نزدیکترین دوستات و بدترین دشمنات میکنن بعدش فکر میکنی که یا باید بذاری بری فرار کنی یا این که روزی صد بار آرزو کنی برگردی اون تو um, So for this week you're going to watch one of Jafar Kanai's films and I'm going to wait for your uh, discussion posts and responses Thank you for listening